right, good morning, everybody. So glad you are here. We are at a new month, starting a new series on my favorite, maybe my favorite book of the Bible, the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, I preached the book of Ecclesiastes many years ago. It's still, I still have people coming up to me saying, oh, Ecclesiastes, man, I'll, I'll tell you why in just a minute. Before we do it, just want to give a couple of shout outs. We had our first big storehouse, I think it's first, maybe in a second, I had to lose track of time. First, a big storehouse sale this past weekend, and I just want to say thank you to the massive army of storehouse workers. Help me thank them for all that they do. If you're unfamiliar with this, across the street, we call it East Campus, is the big warehouse building. You see the storehouse on the building. It started just a few years ago as we just said, hey, let's have a church-wide yard sale and donate everything to missions. And it has just exploded into a massive local ministry organization. And they uh, minister to families all over our community. And it has grown to be a massive army over there. If you're still looking for a place to plug in and serve, it's one incredible opportunity, and it's become like a part church, part uh, thrift department store. It's crazy. Well, you've got to just go peek your head in there sometime. And, and so uh, they're open a couple times a month, but about once a quarter, they have a big sale. And this was that weekend on Friday, this past Friday and Saturday. And um, they do incredible ministry, and they raise money for missions. This, this weekend alone, over $20,000 going to missions. So love it. Love it. So proud of that team. So proud of that ministry. Um, also, uh, you know, I was gone. I took a couple weeks off to get a little breather. And uh, while I'm gone, uh, apparently, uh, my, my brother, my friend, Pastor Mark Cunningham, decided to take some jabs at me last Sunday and uh, try to incriminate me a little bit with some video evidence that he called it of uh, me having trouble walking through a garage door. Um, y'all, one principle of life, never poke the bear, all right? Don't poke the guy who's going to have the microphone next. You just need to understand who you're dealing with when it comes to Brother Mark. Um, This is a man who will dress up as the Grinch for staff meetings, all right? And I do have uh, photographic evidence of this. So all I'm saying is you might not want to believe everything that comes out of the man's mouth. Um, we, we did get some time together last weekend. We went to a couple conferences and, uh, uh, we stayed with the, uh, the Cox family, Joey and Amy Cox, and they took us to play top golf, something I, I'm not a, uh, I love sports, but I'm not a golfer. I'd love to learn. Uh, and so, but he took us to play top golf. Um, but none of us really anticipated the moment where Mark would have Joey actually show him how to hit a golf ball. Uh, and that just, it really got uncomfortable for us for a little bit. And, but you would think after such intimate coaching, you would know how to hit a golf ball. And to be honest with you, I would have said it's impossible to hit a golf ball and it go directly sideways. But I have video evidence to show you that, yes, this is indeed possible. Just watch this. Oh! (laughs) Oh, I got it. (laughs) So, uh, Mark's just a gullible guy. He's just a gullible guy. We have good time together. Uh, I remember a few years ago, any of you remember when that video game uh, Guitar Hero came out and like everybody was playing Guitar Hero? Uh, it was around Christmas time and we were driving down the road and I'm like, dude, have you heard about Guitar Hero? I was telling him about it. He's like, man, this game is blowing up. And he looked at me he's like, so are people okay? I'm like, bro, that's not what blowing up. Anyway. So he's just a little gullible, y'all. So don't believe everything that the man says. Uh, But I tell you, one thing that he and I have in common is, um, you familiar with Murphy's Law, where if whatever can go wrong, just gonna go wrong. 
We share the, the spiritual gift of Murphy in our life. And so I'm going to, we, we, it's a crazy, the, the predicaments we find ourselves in. And that sort of leads up to what we are going to study this month on the book of Ecclesiastes, because that is the book of people who things just don't work out the way you want them to. Anybody ever have a day where it just seemed like everything that could go wrong went wrong? Just raise your hand so we know I'm not alone. Okay, good. <sighs> More than just me and Mark. I can see. Anybody ever been guilty of uh, maybe losing your temper on one of those days every now and then? All right. Okay. Good. Where, where, where did my people? Um, the book of Ecclesiastes is real. It's actually been called the most dangerous book of the Bible, and people fought for it to be removed from the Bible. It's actually one of my favorite because I'm just like, thank you, God, you understand what how hard life can be sometime. And it is if you don't if you don't read it with the right context, it can be like, whoa, what is this doing in the Bible? But I want to provide for you the emotions and the context of Ecclesiastes this month, and I. I want you to leave this month saying, you know what? I know the book of Ecclesiastes. I understand. I can explain it. I, that is so uh, uh, empowering and encouraging when you feel like you understand a book of the Bible. So if you are with us every Sunday, that will be you with this book. So I invite you, even if you want to turn to it, um, if you've got a hard copy Bible, you can grab one of ours under a chair or um, a lot of people go digital nowadays. You can just click on Ecclesiastes. If you're searching for it on a hard copy, middle of the Bible is usually Psalms. Turn to the right, and then you hit Proverbs, and then Ecclesiastes. Today, I just want to introduce it to you and provide the context so the next three weeks, we can just fly through it and learn some really valuable lessons for life. But first, I want to give you a little pop quiz Based, it's in your message notes, and no wrong answer here. I just want to ask you to answer these questions. You can circle your response. Is God simple or complex? What do you think? Just circle the answer there. Next question, is living for Jesus easy or hard? The next question, how important are our works, our good deeds? Very important, not at all important. And then finally, which of these describes life? Is life meaningful or meaningless? Now, let's just back up for a second. Question number one, is God simple or complex? How many of you say God is simple? If you don't mind, share it. You're raising your hand. Awesome, awesome. How many of you think God is complex? Raise your hand. Very cool. Very cool. How many of you realize you know me well enough to know it's probably a trick question, so you're just not going to raise your hand? Um, well, you would, you would all be correct. Uh, I believe the answer is yes. Uh, God is simple. God is complex. The Bible says God is uh, so uh, huge and amazing. The Bible says in, in uh, Corinthians that uh, even God's foolishness is greater than man's greatest wisdom. Like he is, he is so awesome. In fact, you've heard me describe uh, what heaven might be like, where in the Bible it says angels have been surrounding the throne. This was a vision where angels were surrounding the throne and just saying, holy, holy, holy. And that word holy, the closest word we've got is wow. I did a little word study on that word, and it suggests they're seeing something for the very first time, and it's blowing their mind, and they're just saying, wow, holy. And so for, for thousands of years, angels have been seeing something of God for the first time, where God's like, look at this part of me, and they're just Wow. And then he says, now, look at this. Wow. So for all of eternity, we're just going to be in awe of God, of who he is, how awesome. He's so huge, so amazing. His glory is incomprehensible for our earthly brains to comprehend. So yes, God is complex. And yet Jesus says to the little child, come, come on up. Don't, don't keep the children away from me. Suffer not the little children to come to me. In fact, if you want to know me, you kind of got to be like a child. 
You kind of got to approach me with this. He's so simple that someone could walk through these doors, having never been to church, never read the Bible, and meet him and know him and love him and walk with him. He's so simple that even a child can know him. So he's, the answer is yes. And Jesus introduces us to a lot of paradoxes in Scripture. Paradoxes is just things that sound contradictory, but they're not. Where Jesus would say, hey, you know, the last, you're going to be first. And the first, you're going to be last. And if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. And those who give up their life for my sake, you'll actually find it. And so over and over, Jesus is sort of stretching our thinking and understanding of what the kingdom is like by just sharing these. And so the next question was, is living for Jesus easy or hard? How many say easy? How many say hard? And you're both correct. Uh, Jesus says, I'm going to send you out like sheep among wolves. They hated me. They're going to hate you. You will be persecuted. You will face trials. And yet, he also said, if you're tired, if you're wounded, if you're burned out, come to me. I'm going to give you rest because my yoke is light. I'm going to show you the way to live this life with a light yoke. It's a way of love. So simultaneously, it is both. Uh, Do our works count for a lot or little? Uh, The answer is is yes. Uh, They count for a lot. In the book of James chapter 2, it says, faith without works is dead. Uh, What good are we if we read his word and then go away and not do what it says? Our work count for a lot. In a few weeks, I'm going to do a message where it shows um, like we're all going to face God's judgment, and there will be a couple of judgments. One is, uh, do we know him? And then comes a fun judgment where it's kind of like uh, standing before the judges at a uh, cheerleading competition where God, uh, Jesus says, I just get to uh, lavish you with gifts based off of your work. So our works count for a lot, but when it comes to our relationship with him, they count for nothing at all. In fact, in Ephesians, it says uh, we are saved by grace alone, not by works, so that none of us can boast. When it comes to our salvation, our works mean nothing because Jesus paid the full price. Jesus gets all the glory. And that should give us confidence to know that your forgiveness and your salvation is not based on your obedience. It is totally based on his obedience, his work, his sacrifice. That's why we can put all our trust in him, and it is he alone that we are saved. And so our works, when it comes to salvation, mean nothing. But yet when it comes to our reward and making a difference, it means a lot. So it is both. And then finally, is life meaningful or meaningless? Yeah, Life is beautiful and precious and fragile. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. What a gift to be on this earth. And yet so much is meaningless. In fact, the author of Ecclesiastes starts it out like this, where he says, meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And if you read this, you think, wait a minute, is this really in the Bible? Is it supposed to be in the Bible? There's a little bit of debate over who wrote this book of the Bible. Uh, Some might argue that this person actually wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, because it is one of the most depressing books you are ever going to read. Like the whole thing is life stinks. In In the book of Ecclesiastes, the author actually says, it is better just not to even be born. I hate my life. That's in the Bible? Yep. In fact, uh, years ago, I preached this book of the Bible, uh, and I suggested, and this is why people still to this day will come up to me and say, hey, Ecclesiastes. I suggested for any of you who have trouble with uh, maybe the words coming out of your mouth, maybe you got a little potty mouth sometime, how about just replace those words with a new Christian cuss word, Ecclesiastes, because that is really, to sum up just a hard day, I just say that is the book of Ecclesiastes. Like, uh, this guy, he just was struggling, he was miserable, he hated his life, nothing was working out right, That is, and the word Ecclesiastes just basically means I'm letting y'all know, just I'm announcing. He says, everything stinks. Everything stinks. 
That, this is something uh, Mark and I have in common. We have to just laugh so we don't cry, but it seems like we just kind of walk with the spirit of Murphy, uh, Murphy's Law, where whatever can go wrong goes wrong sometimes. And some of you have those days. You know what I'm talking about. Um, I had one not too long ago. Started out well. Started out with good intentions, but I told, uh, this is a principle I try to, I've tried to instill in my kids. Like, when you are working for someone, pay attention to their intensity level and don't let their intensity level be greater than your intensity level. In other words, if you have a boss and your boss comes in red-faced, moving fast, looking impatient, stressed out, don't be sitting there playing solitaire. Like, that's going to... You're going to get your butt chewed out. You're going to lose your job. Like, if the boss is intense, you be just as intense. It will serve you well in life. So I tell my kids, if I got limited time and we're out in the yard and I'm like, all right, we need pine cones picked up. We need some weed eating. We need this trip. And I'm running around like crazy. And I look over and y'all just kind of throw on some pine cones at each other. I'm going to get a little stressed out. My blood pressure is going to go up a little bit. And so this was one of those days where I had just a very small window of opportunity, but my son's car was like way overdue uh, for having the oil changed. And I thought, okay, and this was a car we had just picked up for him, so it was time for the first oil change. I wanted him to know how to do it. I've got 20 minutes. I'm like, all right, son, if you will stay by my side Give me the tools I need. I'm going to show you how. We're going to walk you through it. We're going to knock this out. We got just enough time to get this done. So I, we bag it up into the yard, into the grass. I'm like, all right, hand me that tool. First, we got to get under there, get the bolt off. We got to drain the oil. We got to get the, the, the oil filter off of there. So I go to get under his car, and uh, I didn't realize that there was about three inches of gap between the ground and the car. Like, this is a low rider, all right? And, and I'm... I'm in a hurry, so I'm like, I can do this. I can make it work. So I'm pulling myself under the car. I mean, it's scraping me, scratching me. I finally get to where one hand can see and reach the bolt, and the other hand's like this. I'm just telling them what tool. I'm like, no, wrong size. Give me a different one. I'm, 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 it's hurting. I'm straining. I finally get, get the, the, the wrench on the, on the bolt, and, and we just I start trying. It is not budging. It is not budging. So now I'm in this awkward position. I'm hollering. I'm straining. Finally, I just give it one. I'm sweating. Cars like scratching. I'm come one big just. And at that moment, I just feel every muscle in my back just sort of just stretch and tear and go out on me. Now I'm under the car. My back is thrown out. I did manage to get it loose, and I just got to pull myself out. I got to crawl out of the car. I'm, I'm hurting. I'm in intense pain now. Sweat pouring. It's hot. I'm under the car. I'm like, hi, hand me the oil filter. He hands me the oil filter, and I've never seen this before. I don't know what to do. Apparently, some cars nowadays, the oil filter is under the hood and not under the bottom. Has, has anyone else know this? If you're familiar with this, raise your hand. And we had several elderly ladies raise their hand for service. It really emasculated me for a minute. Um, but <laughs> some of you knew that this was new to me. I'm under there. I'm like, I, what is, the, dude, there's no oil filter under. I'm getting the owner's manual out. I'm pulling it up on YouTube. You know, I'm just like, how do I, I figure out it is under the hood up top. There's a little bit of oil filter, new thing they're doing now. So I'm like, all right. Son, we got, to, we got the bolt loose. I get up under there. I see the old one, but you got, there's this big bolt, like this big monster bolt. I don't have a tool for this. I'm trying to barehand it. I'm getting like a bottle cap open. There ain't nothing working on this. I am so frustrated at this point. Finally, I'm like, son, I got to go to the store and buy a tool. I'm just spinning out the driveway trying to get, find this tool. I just show a picture. I'm like, just give me something for this. Run back home. Pop it on there, sure enough, boom, unscrews, piece of cake, nothing to it. I'm like, okay, we're out of time, super stressed off. I'm like, all right, son, here's what we got to do. I got to get the oil filter in here, but first, we've got to drain the oil. 
I, my back is killing me. I cannot squeeze myself under the car again. But I see a little divot in the, in the yard, like two feet, two feet further. I'm like, son, if we can just move the car two feet, I'll be able to get under there much easier. We'll drain the oil. We'll pop the oil filter on. Change it out, good to go, let's do it. So I'm standing there over the hood. I said, all right, so just back it up two feet. Well, that was the moment that I learned if you crank up a car with the oil cap off, all the dirty oil comes spraying back at your face. Ecclesiastes. <laughs> I have a lot of those moments, a lot of those moments. So that's my Christian cuss word to some of you are looking for some new words. Just so oh. now you kind of understand the context of Ecclesiastes a little bit. Let me just share with you. I, all I want to do right now is I just wanted to give you a little bit of understanding so that we approach this book the right way. We're going to spend the next three weeks learning some valuable lessons. But I want you to understand where the author is in life. Most people, and I agree, it was written by uh, King David's son, Solomon. And Solomon, as a young boy, was promoted to king, and God visited him in a dream. And God actually said to young Solomon, whatever you pray for, I will grant you. I want to help you. And Solomon said, God... I watched my dad, David. He did pretty good. He loved you. He followed you. He honored you. He said, but I'm young. I don't know how to be a good king. I don't know how to lead people. I want to be a good king. Will you give me the gift of wisdom and discernment? And God said, wow. You could have asked for riches you could have asked for fame. You could have asked for me to kill all your enemies. And yet, you asked for wisdom. You asked to walk in discernment, to be a just and righteous king. Therefore, I am going to bless you with all that you pray for. I'm going to give you more wisdom than anyone's ever had. I'm going to give you discernment. And I'm even going to give you things that you didn't ask for. I'm going to bless you with riches and honor beyond what any king has ever experienced before. And then God ends that conversation by saying, Now, Solomon, I give you all this. Now, if you will walk in my ways and follow my instruction, I'm going to give you a long life. And that was the moment of decision that all of us have. We've all been blessed by God, gifted by God, given things by God to be used for His glory. And God says, now, I'm going to give this to you. And if you'll use it for my glory, you're going to have an amazing life. It's up to you. And unfortunately, we learn from Solomon that you can be so incredibly gifted. But if you start leaning on your own gifts and strengths, it can lead you down some really destructive paths. And I just want you to picture, I think we have an image. Now we have Solomon as an old man reaching the end of his days. And he's looking back over the life that he has lived. And he was full of wisdom one of the wisest men who's ever lived. In fact, he wrote the book of Proverbs. And if you've ever read Proverbs, you could read one Proverbs a day and just meditate on it all day. Just one verse, meditate on it all day. Every verse is just packed with wisdom. So this is a man that was full of just understanding, full of giftedness. And yet, he used that for his own personal pleasure, his own personal endeavors. In fact, he says, whatever my heart wanted, I went for. He says, I denied myself nothing. And now we have an old man 
sitting full of regret and shame. And he says, people of God, please learn from me. I walk down road after road after road after road. And this one ends in destruction. This one ends in pain. This one ends in regret. He says, listen, I know what you want. I know what you're tempted by. I know what you think you want. But take it from me. I denied myself nothing. Like, you think you want a bigger house, and that'll make you happy? I bought all the houses I wanted. You think more land? You think something nicer? You think uh, if you just had a, a companion? Hey, he had all the women he wanted. He's like, listen, I went for it. Anything my heart wanted, I gave myself to. Take it from this old man. I hate my life. It was all meaningless. It's chasing after the wind. We have the opportunity this month to sit at the feet of someone who lived life poorly. And in his final days, he's looking back at what an opportunity he had. So gifted by God. He could have done so much, and yet, he lived for himself, and now here he is hating life. And I think it can save all of us some heartbreak, some pain, some regret, if we will just listen to the words of Ecclesiastes and say, God, I don't want to go the same path. So I'm excited for this month. I hope you'll join us. Come every, month, or come every week this month, and you'll know the heart behind this book of Ecclesiastes. But just give you a little sneak peek. These are some of the major principles we will hit this month. And you can write these down. Number one, I want you to remember that life is made of seasons. And this is critical. I've just I've learned that as we go through life, there are very critical transition points. And one of the messages this month, I'm going to talk to you about these critical seasons of life, these critical transition seasons, because most of you are probably in one, about to be in one, or coming out of one, and it's very critical that you uh, get from that season what God intends you to get. And so I want to I talk with you and sort of give you some guidance and wisdom for those critical seasons of what they can mean to you. And um, also, if you are in a dark season, a painful season, I promise you, I promise you, it will pass. This too shall pass. I promise it's temporary. I promise there is another, there is another sign. The dawn will come. The clouds will part. Hold on. Hold on to Him. Life is full of these seasons, and some are tough and painful and dark. If you're in there, hold on. I promise you there's hope. This season will pass. And the next principle, every season has highs and lows. If you're in a great season, there are things you can complain about. But if you're in a dark season, there are things you can put your hope in and trust in and look forward to. And God teaches us the discipline of think on things that are excellent and praiseworthy to get you through those dark seasons of life. So we'll look at that a little bit. Another principle, there are many, many, many roads that lead to regret. And hopefully, we can all be spared some of these journeys by learning some of the lessons from Solomon in Ecclesiastes. And as I said at the beginning, I'm so thankful that God understands our pain, that sometimes life stinks, sometimes life is painful and God gets it and I'm so glad that he decided to include this book in our Bible to just say yeah I know I know how tough and unfair life can be here on earth and then finally 
despite the past, there is still hope for all of us to finish well. No matter how bad you've fallen and messed up and no matter how broken things have been, there is still hope for all of us to live a life that brings him glory and to finish well in this earth and on, in our time here to, for his glory. So I want to encourage you to come back each week. I just want to close this message by just praying for you for a minute, um, especially for those that are walking in a dark season and life doesn't make sense and it feels very painful and, and broken. I want to pray for you, and I just want to say, um, I have learned that no matter how ugly or hopeless or dark things get, God is good, and He's faithful, and He'll have the final word, and He will make all things new. And your pain will not have the final word. I want you to hold on to him. I want you to cling to him. I want you to trust him that in his time and in his way. So let me pray for you now. Father, thank you for being good in a broken world. Thank you for being faithful in a faithless world. God, thank you for your promises. Thank you for examples like Solomon who tell us, don't go the way I went. Don't live the life I lived. Let me save you years of pain and trouble, God. I pray we soak up every lesson this month from this powerful, real, and raw book of your word. Father, I pray now, I want to pray encouragement for those who are in a dark season of life, a painful morning season of life, God. I thank you for reminders like blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted and those who are broken hearted that you will be close to them God I want to pray for those whose hearts are heavy and hearts are burdened may today today be a reminder that you are with them I believe the Lord would say to you I am with you I've not forsaken you I've not forgotten you my word is true my promises are true you can cling to them through the darkness, through the pain, through the storms. He is faithful. You can count on him. You can be all in on him. You can give him every ounce of trust and hope. Cling to him. He will have the final word. Your pain will not have the final say. Your grief will not have the last word. The time will come where God says, no more pain, no more sadness, no more disease, no more death, no more oppression, no more slavery, no more bondage, no more hate, no more hurt. He will make all things new. We will say, death, now where is your sting? Death, where is your victory now? Victory comes in Jesus Christ alone. He is the way, the truth, and the life. All things are made new in Him. All things are redeemed and restored and renewed. All things will be made right again. Just hold on, hold on. Cling to Him and His promises. He is with you. He promised He will never leave you nor forsake you. He's with you in the darkness. He's with you in the storm. Ride out this season. And on the other side, you will be able to testify, my God is good. My God is faithful. He led us through the darkest hour. And then when the cloud parts and the dawn breaks and the light is revealed, then you will be able to dance and praise Him like you never have before. Just hold on. Hold on. He's with you. He's with you. God, have mercy. Have mercy and come quickly into these situations. 
have your way quickly, God. Don't let our enemies laugh in our faces. Don't let our enemies prosper while we suffer, God. Show mercy. God, bring hope to the hurting. If you're here today and you've just been apart from God and not living for, I want to invite you home today. As I said in the beginning, our works count for nothing when it comes to a relationship with Jesus. He gets all the glory of our salvation. He alone paid the full price on the cross. And when he said it is finished, it was completely paid for in full. Nothing more to do. He has placed that gift of eternal life in your hands this morning. He simply says, by faith, receive it, open it, walk in it, trust in it. He's paid for it. He's paid for it. Today, I want to send you home with the assurance of your salvation, knowing that you are walking with him intimately, that all your sins have been paid for, washed away, forgiven. Then, yeah, we still got work to do. We still got work to do as his disciples. But when it comes to knowing him, being forgiven by him, that is done. That is finished. And the Bible says simply by faith, say yes to that gift but confess with your mouth that yes, Jesus, you are Lord. You paid the price. You get the glory. Receive his forgiveness. And so I just want to end by giving you that opportunity right now. All of us in the house, here's what we're going to do. We're going to with our lips out loud, we're going to proclaim that he is Lord and receive that gift of forgiveness. And for any man, woman, boy, or girl here today, you've been living apart from God. Come on, let's start fresh in him. Let's not travel down that broken broken road any longer. Say yes to him right now. Come on, church, with passion, with conviction, with boldness. Pray this with me today. Say, dear Jesus, I believe you are Lord. Take my life. Wash me clean. Forgive me of all my junk, all my sin. Restore my life. Give me a fresh start. Fill me with your love and your presence. Thank you, Jesus. You are Lord. You get the glory. 